Good morning, everyone. I'm here in uh, Cork, in Ireland. I'm at the University College Cork, but it's early morning, so I'm not yet there, but I will go there uh, later today. It's my pleasure to talk to you this morning about glass transitions in food process and product development. It's an area where I have been doing some contributions over the years. Much of that here in Cork, this is uh, where I am, an island just uh, west from UK on its own Republic of Ireland. And, and I looked at uh, the distance from here, Cork to Tedspur is uh, about uh, 10,000 kilometers. So we are reasonably far away. Now I can see that um, some audience are coming in. So I welcome you all to this uh, session and I hope you would uh, enjoy. Although I could not come in person all the way, but I'm there in a way in a person. So let me start um, this uh, discussion and um, uh, move to the next slide. I briefly cover this morning what uh, is material science and the classic state. I will talk about uh, state diagrams and I will also talk about uh, structural relaxation times and some uh, uh, ways of uh, doing a an mathematical analysis what, on what they mean. And I also introduce a concept I call solid strength that we have introduced uh, some time ago. We will also then look at uh, as examples processing and products, uh, especially what happens in uh, food extrusion, in spray drying, in frozen states, and then finally conclude. The time is not that uh, long. This is uh, where I am located in, uh, in Cork. This is our food science and technology building. So this slide here now uh, tells you a little bit about history. And uh, I have uh, included here some aspects about um, food technologies and food engineering and also the material science. So if we look at uh, the processes and the needs uh, of understanding materials, we can start far away from years, uh, decades, thousands of years ago when um, the drying of foods was recognized as a method that people could keep uh, the food quite stable over a period uh, that was needed. But then not really before the uh, end of 18th century, uh, there was um, equipment coming where uh, food could be industrially processed to the dry state. And uh, in the end of the hundred years later, we could first see freezing coming on board, though that became then an industrial process uh, not much more than a hundred years ago, which is uh, now established well. Freeze drying as well, uh, about um, 60, 70 years ago, started to be a, a technology and about 50 years ago, uh, introduction of freeze-dried uh, coffees. At the same time, people could look at also what is the uh, solids uh, contribution to chemical activity of foods. And uh, people recognize that the materials are not fully crystalline. They are non-crystalline substances and people knew about the amorphous state but not much uh, before uh, the end of 80s, glass transition was really coming on board uh, and people started to look at uh, in um, detail what glass transition actually means in terms of processing food and stabilizing foods. Of course, Harry Levine and Louis Slade, who are colleagues uh, working on this uh, area, a little bit longer than myself perhaps, but um, they published a lot of interviews and literature reviews on uh, the importance of water relations and uh, glass transitions in foods. So the whole area nowadays we look at as uh, food material science, we look at structure, function, properties, 
and we look at also not only functionality in the foods and the technological characteristics, but we also look at delivery properties. What can be achieved when we understand the material state and we have come from dried foods to frozen foods, intermediate foods and delivery systems on the way. The class transition as such was uh, well known uh, decades and uh, maybe hundreds of years ago, but uh, there was a professor uh, in uh, Stanford University in the 1920s, 30s, uh, Professor Parks, who introduced uh, a lot of basic uh, ideas on how biological and organic classes form and how they behave. So I have taken his data here just to emphasize that uh, if we look at a non-crystalline structure, we would have many uh, problems in that uh, we don't uh, well understand how these materials uh, exactly change from one state to another one, but we would certainly find changes in heat capacity, thermal expansion coefficient, dielectric properties, and mechanical properties such as the viscosity. These are typical properties of class. Zucker classes have been looked at quite a lot. If we look at um, amorphous sugar, non-crystalline sugar, that is what we often find in many confectionery products. We can obtain that uh, by just uh, when schooling, melting crystalline sugar, and then we can even spin it to get a uh, uh, sugar floss or cotton candy, and we can also melt a material and an extrusion to get uh, formed uh, materials. We can mill a material and that uh, introduces some problems in many cases because the milling uh, may break crystals and that leads also to an increased uh, quantity of amorphous sugar. Then drying processes are well known to produce particles. Particles need to be solid. The solid often is not crystalline but it's non-crystalline and that gives uh, particular properties to powders. Also, we could have roller drying like here. Then if we compare these states, we need a solid state in many cases. We also need to know how it transfers to more liquid. Like here, the glassy solid state is uh, solid liquid, we could say. Uh, it is uh, coming from the uh, viscous liquid to the solid state. It's very typical of carbohydrates. It's very common in food structures. It um, can form structures in blends. So we can blend different materials and we can get a uniform glass if the components are um, miscible. So that means that we can actually formulate a product uh, depending on what we want. And then we can do many uh, nice things like entrap uh, materials inside the glasses. And that is another aspect of what we do in uh, understanding material science. If we look at the crystalline state, solid to liquid transformation happens in a precise condition. Well defined conditions in a thermodynamic term. And it's also typical of carbohydrates but carbohydrates can be made to non-crystalline as well. It uh, is very often more like a defect than a good property in storied foods. But of course we have materials that we like to be crystalline. If we have a crystalline sugar and we like to transport it, it would be uh, for a normal state to that sort of materials. But it is, a single substance. We cannot easily make blends or crisp and crystallized blends. We can do it in metals if we like to, but uh, that's a different, uh, completely different story. We don't really get that in the uh, food area. But we can do inclusions uh, with some materials like cyclodextrins to entrap components inside crystals and that's a nice other uh, matter. Importance of class science uh, is shown here. I have uh, summarized historical background. If we look, look at these products, they are very common. We all enjoy them and they are often something that uh, is uh, done in large quantities. Uh, the technology is well known, but uh, the class transition is affecting what we get. 
So if you look at hard sucrose candy, it's in principle a liquid that is cooled to its classy state. The viscosity is 10 to 12 pascal second or higher. That provides a solid characteristic. Then if we look at uh, what happens above that, we can find a lot of defects that we have studied. And that relates to powders. If we think about the powder, I said it has to be a solid particle. If it's not a solid particle, it will not uh, flow. It gets sticky and it gets into the liquid. And that is uh, a problem if we have a humid condition like you may have now, now in there in Tetsburg, but we don't have that humid here in the island. We have freeze drying. The whole freeze drying is based on the class transition understanding in the frozen state and in the dried state. And stability of ice cream likewise. So these are things that were also recognized well by Harry Levin and Louis Laid, who I introduced earlier. They are here with one of my friends, Ted Labusa. And uh, Ted has been contributing to water activity, as you may know. And Harry and Louis, Louis this is Louis Laid, and this is Harry Levin. They worked on the average micelle theory, mainly on stars, because that relates to uh, the uh, stars' uh, non partially crystalline state. But they also were very much emphasizing this area here. If you look at an Arrhenius plot of a material, that forms a glass. You will find that at low temperatures, we have linear relationship between uh, relaxation time, or say viscosity against temperature. And uh, then if we come to class transition, we have a nonlinear ex exponential change. And then far away from that, we have a fluid and our new state. This is the WLF relationship that could be applied to understand this uh, change and relaxation times. What we also need always to recognize in food area that water is everywhere and water has an impact on the properties of the foods that contain the non-crystalline components. It has a small molecular size. It moves very rapidly in structures and also in the classic materials, it's able to move, but it, uh, expands the material. It has a, a mobility that uh, causes uh, expansion, but also depression of the class transition temperature. So these plasticizing molecules are softeners, and we see that often in uh, materials that uh, absorb water from the surroundings, they tend to get uh, softer and perhaps uh, more fluid and sticky and so on. And we need to know the water activity and the water relationships uh, in materials to understand really what's going on in many foods. And that is shown here. First, if we look at this diagram here. Now, this is the state diagram of sucrose. We worked um, quite hard about 30 years ago to get these uh, transitions exactly where they are. That means melting of uh, water in a frozen state but also how the glass forms and how the ice is maximally uh, created in the fro and embedded in a frozen material. And based on that information, we could find that there is a frozen state glass transition that relates to maximally freeze concentrated material. We find that the um, melting temperature for ice, that is concentration independent as well. And then if we have no ice, we have this uh, water content dependence of the class transition against the uh, water content. Class transition of water happens around at minus 135 Celsius. So that's uh, easily um, formed uh, in cold uh, conditions, drop a uh, uh, tiny uh, droplet of water in liquid nitrogen, you can get classic water by quench cooling. And then this is uh, dry sugar about 70 degrees. So that explains that we can keep uh, a material fairly stable here. If we exceed the class transition, we can get the crystallization as an example. Crystallization happens because if we look at thermodynamic properties, we can plot here Gibbs energy and say, what is the relationship of Gibbs energy against temperature? If we have a material that is liquid, like molten sucrose, we actually have to cool it to below the 
equilibrium melting temperature of the liquid, but it doesn't crystallize, so it continues as a liquid, and it uh, gives energy states higher than the uh, crystalline equilibrium state. So the more far away from uh, that we are, the bigger is the driving force, the delta C. And uh, if conditions allow, like above glass transition, there's mobility and we see crystallization. If we are below the glass transition, we have immobile uh, molecules. They are, they are immobilized in the glassy structure and it does not then crystallize easily. These state diagrams uh, developed over the years. I have shown here one that is uh, the result of uh, undergraduate studies of Don Rasmussen in the 1960s. And uh, he's still active professor in the Clemson University in America. Uh, Felix Franks uh, was working quite a lot. You may have seen the name of uh, Felix Franks. He was uh, the research uh, director a long time at Unilever and then entrepreneur himself making many contributions in the pharmaceutical and fish frying areas. But he, in the 1970s, was uh, also working on this, uh, and there are a number of papers on those. He was uh, introducing the concept to Harry Levine and was late as well, and um, he passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, this is Harry Levine and Louis Lade uh, state diagram. And this uh, next here is something we have uh, contributed uh, beyond. We uh, have here shown what uh, may be important in food processing. If you look at this diagram here, it's difference of scanning calorimeter data on how classes may behave. And we have always a uh, history dependent transition. And the, the behavior means uh, that we always can have a difference in the molecular assembly and that reflects the thermodynamic uh, results of measurements. But if we are here in the main diagram looking at the volume or enthalpy or entropy about the class transition, we have a, a long range of temperatures where uh, the relaxation times are going to be more and more rapid. So if we look at glass transition, that's where the molecules freeze into the glassy state and we don't really see mobility. So translational mobility is stopped. Then if we go to some degree above, the like 20 degrees here, about the glass transition, the relaxation times dramatically decrease. And we could do another isostate of uh, relaxation times and we can see that there are isostates uh, where we have relative relaxation time about equal. So we can see what is the relationship, water plasticization and thermoplasticization. So we can use these rational relaxation times in um, the uh, food area. And then if we look at how to get them, these are some methods we use, um, mechanical relaxation. Many foods are powders. So it's difficult to cut a piece of glass to a mechanical measurement, but we can introduce a powder inside a pocket that is magnetal and then um, fix that into a probe where we can have a, that inside a measuring chamber to control the humidity or control the uh, temperature and do a dynamic run and find relaxation times. The same we can do with this, which is electrodes and we uh, apply uh, a voltage that is changing uh, in a sinusoidal way. And then we can uh, say again, get the relaxation time from the frequency relationship. If we then apply these relaxation times, we have uh, often in the literature a number of different ways to handle them. This is William Slander very coming from their publication 1956 saying that uh, uh, constant C1 and C2 are needed and the temperature difference to class transition. Now we are about the class transition. This is another uh, plot of uh, class transition. So we are above here and above that we have a um, exponentially changing uh, relaxation time which is ratio here and uh, this could be also viscosity. The same we can do with the so-called VTF model and that is actually shown here that they are related. You can 
you can do uh, both, but take into account some conver conversations and uh, mathematical models. We may also like to know what is the relationship of the relaxation time to real time. So what happens in real time? I put here some um, data from uh, Judson King's uh, group. Uh, he was professor in uh, Berkeley, California, and he did uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, very slow studies to find viscosities for different sugars at low temperatures because they had a big interest in the uh, frozen, frozen state for uh, freeze drying problems. If we look at uh, this diagram, then I have put here a glass transition curve and also the uh, real time observations. The relationship here is shown as a Deborah number. If we look at, for example, that we have a problem in spray drying or particles sticking together, we may see that that happens at the contact time where that is about a uh, decrease to about 10 seconds uh, in reality, but the relaxation time would be 100 of the second. So that uh, relationship uh, seems to be quite uh, applicable and useful. This is the uh, WLF relationship. Uh, this is a complex uh, picture because what we are saying here is that this uh, equation actually gives you these all curves, depending what you uh, assign as C1 and C2, if it's minus or plus. This one here, the red one, is what we know as the so-called universal WLF uh, relationship. But I have, um, with my group shown that it's not really that. It's not uh, working well. The more important is the green one that is uh, using the same relationship, but the constants are not the universal. And we can identify here a range where actually foods tend to be in terms of uh, storage, uh, processing, and so on. So we have an interest to understand how we can manipulate composition how we can manipulate conditions uh, to such that we obtain structures and properties and stability that is required. So uh, the uh, idea with the whole thing here is as well to show that this C1, depending what's the value, it shows the number of decades that uh, is uh, logarithmic scale for changing uh, when temperatures are changing and then the CETO gives the infinity point. This applies well if we look at this one. Now I have here structural relaxation time for non-crystalline lactose. And we looked at how does it crystallize and we measured times for months in uh, uh, crystallization uh, condition. And uh, we saw that uh, a few minutes to months are about the same as the relaxation times, and we find that these would be uh, uh, here according to the Deborah number. Well, this uh, then also emphasizes that uh, everything is dependent on water, and that's why I put here time versus water plasticization, because one has to take into account how actually, in this case, lactose changes uh, because of water absorption, and we can get it quite nicely effort, and then the class transition and the water absorption together. So we can identify a zone where dairy powders, for example, are stable, and they can man be manufactured in that stable state. But if we exceed the critical values, then we have a problem. Stickiness, crystallization of lactose, and so on. So, uh, to the final uh, slides, then I will introduce some concepts that are important in the processing and product development. If we look at the extrusion, what we'll see here, the next rule on giving out uh, a puffing of a cereal starch-based material. What happens here is that the melt is convert, ma made into the uh, barrel. It's taken to the expansion. Expansion happens because this water expanding, it forms the structure that becomes porous, but at the same time, the uh, vapor goes out, the material dries, and it also cools, which means that it sits as a glass. That the glass is the porous membranes, and you may have an uh, 
textural experience when you eat it as a crispy snack. We can make it into film as well. This is just a sugar film coming from extruder. And this is a pasta, well-known example of extrusion. And uh, we can do uh, breakfast cereals. We can do the uh, paper candies. This is just sugar candy made into seeds. And uh, the idea basically is to form different uh, types of materials like, depending on the level of plasticization and level of expansion. So we uh, produce uh, something similar to plastics from food materials. So this is in the terms of the class transition property. So we have a, here a state diagram for starts. It's heated to a melted uh, state where the most amylopectin amylose uh, mainly melts and then rapid cooling of course through the dye to the classy state. Then if we look at uh, what is the present state we are able to form this, what would you say is that um, this process extrusion gives somewhat, somewhat, somewhat random uh, formation of a three-dimensional structure. If we then transfer this information to what we know as uh, 3D printers, we can get to these, which are sugar, amorphous sugar printed to all kind of fancy structures. So the difference there is really that uh, a 3D printer can uh, have a computer uh, control for flow while this is random, and then you settle it to a solid. Spray drying is uh, well established. I show this to show the history. This is what's the first patent of uh, uh, free, uh, uh, spray drying from 1872, showing that you can dry liquid uh, droplets uh, to a solid state if they contain drying particles. And then that is in 2013, a new factory in New Zealand producing 30,000 kilograms of uh, milk powder in an hour. That's a huge quantity from about 300,000 liters of milk. Um, so if we look at the, this process, uh, uh, there's a lot of empirical uh, relationships that have been taken on board to make a product uh, through the chamber and subsequent fluidized bed and then to the powder form. In big quantities, uh, well understood material. But this is not what you see often. This is the way the particles behave. And that is saying that if you have a concentrate, you have a fluid that needs to go through the drying process in conditions that do not uh, result in uh, stickiness on the wall. And you, at the end, get a powder that is solid. So one has to look at the, the temperature-water content relationships in the uh, formulation. If the formulation fails, the product fails. And that is often because the glass state can be not be uh, obtained. This is for lactose. We can see there's some drying of particles and cooling of particles when they get semi-dry. Towards the end of drying, maybe at the fluidized bed, they do not ha have that much stickiness any longer, but they need to be dried to the final state and then go to the classic state of the main component, here being lactose. The proteins do not cause that much stickiness. Again, in a state diagram form, this is the process. This is lactose state diagram. Evaporation through the dryer to the cooling and the powder comes out. So fairly simple, but uh, not uh, systematically known until recent times. If we put another formulation made of fructose, we cannot do it because the, these transitions are so low. Class transition of fructose at only five degrees. So if you try to produce a, a powder from a fruit juice, it was, it's not going to uh, work. And that is because this fructose and glucose don't stay as solid at normal conditions, especially with some water. If we put some maltodextrin there, we will see that uh, there is a much higher glass transition and we mix them together and may be successful. Freeze drying of coffee also became a, a product 
in 1960s, and that um, included a lot of studies on the collapse and so on, which we now understand why that happens, so, and also frozen state stability of products. So in freeze drying, one also can play with uh, understanding the material properties to get the uh, proper materials. And this is what we did to understand that uh, better with Professor Marcus Carrell. He uh, used to work at MIT. And then uh, we together worked on this area and we introduced this uh, state diagram of sucrose where we explained all these uh, material properties uh, below uh, that affect the frozen state characteristics of foods. And if we look at what happens in freeze drying, we could use the same diagram here for lactose and see that we freeze, we could freeze milk and take it to the freeze dryer and then we allow it to sublimate, keeping the material in the glassy state throughout. And we get a nice porous material that uh, is like the solution with no water. And uh, again, we can look at these transitions, especially the TM prime for freeze drying and we can see that if we mix the material, so we formulate it, we can uh, manipulate how the conditions of freeze drying would fit the product. In recent times, we were uh, interested in understanding what happens about the class transition and how composition can be used to uh, manipulate uh, the end result. So we introduced uh, a WLF-based uh, concept of solid uh, strength. This is the NS and we have the WLF constants and we have a decade uh, of uh, change in relaxation time here. In this uh, theory, we look at um, how much does the temperature about the class transition affect this uh, change in relaxation time. And if we fix it to four decades, we can see that trehalose mixed with uh, whey protein isolate, trehalose alone is very sensitive. A little bit the increase about um, less than 20 degrees about the glass transition would cause problems. We add uh, some WPI, we see that there's a substantial increase in the material property or strength flow solidity uh, about the glass transition. We also in that uh, regard need to know the effect of water and we have uh, plotted that there uh, with um, some different water contents for lactose and lactose WPI mixtures. And we see that the more water we have, the more problems we may create in the product. And that is summarized here. If we look at trihalose and WPI or trihalose and maltodextrin mixtures, we could do some comparison. So these uh, blue lines here are showing what is the strength number. And uh, then the class transition is uh, the cut here. And if we look at the uh, increase in molecular size, we can see that, uh, that the class transition goes up. But if we increase the uh, strength, we can extend the uh, behavior as we like uh, about the class transition. The more we have the high volume rate, the bigger seems the strength be. So the strength that explains the proneness of the class transition. It also uh, has a time factor, the relaxation time effect that we see in processes like extrusion, drying and so on. We manipulate that by composition and water content and uh, we uh, would often assume that the glassy state is needed in the storage, but in processing we need to have processes about the glass transition. So finally I come to the conclusions and I emphasize here a few uh, points. First, that the food performance in processing requires good knowledge on the material and water relationships. The state diagrams I introduced, they are essential to understand many processes. Some of here are freezing, drying and extrusion, but many others as well. And the stability of the materials as well. The structural relaxation time and this strength concept, they provide quantitative material specific data that are useful in more deep 
formulation science and more deep uh, processing uh, mapping of products. And then the strength complements what we knew about the class transition, but the relaxation times are essential part of that to formulation processing and storage limits of foods. So this is a few of my recent students who have contributed to this uh, uh, data. Professor Pampang Nurhadi from Indonesia, Fang Hui Fan from China, Aaron Lim from Malaysia, Valentin Maidanuk from Ukraine, and Larry Sebo, this is uh, from uh, Thailand originally. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed and 